Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and this is another Old Rusty video where we're going to continue to work on the motor or the engine of Old Rusty. I have been cleaning up a lot of separate parts. We're going to install a water pump, we're going to install a flywheel, the pressure plate for the uh, clutch, the carburetor and we're still going to take the carburetor apart and clean it all out at the inside. Uh, we're going to fix the distributor which is already been cleaned up but it doesn't really matter you see all that in the video on how we're going to put all this back together and of course we need to install the intake and exhaust manifold so with any further ado um, let's start with the intake and exhaust manifold so the intake and exhaust manifold are bolted together and i actually have it shell blasted with garnet 360 inside but also on the outside and I already painted it with a heat resistant paint. So overall uh, this intake manifold is quite all right um, as you can see. That looks fairly good. However there is a bit of an issue right here. The studs are broken off or badly damaged. I have new studs for them so they will have to go in but first of all I will have to be able to remove the old ones. Um, so I'm going to try to heat him up and then uh, try to get him out. If that doesn't work, I will cut him off level with the flange and then drill him out. And then maybe I can recover the tread or re-tap the tread. Yet to be seen on how we're going to do this. So I'm going to start with the top one. I'm going to try actually to um, undo it with some heat. Now for the first one, I still have a bit of tread left. So I'm going to try to put a nut up and a counter nut. And then I probably might be able to um, get it loose if I warm it up. On the other ones, I may have to weld on a nut. So all options. And you can already feel that the tread isn't all that good anymore. All right, so let's see. That's not gonna go. No. That doesn't wanna go yet. I'm afraid it's gonna be one that we will have. Oh, it's coming a little bit. Or it's just twisting off, that's the other option. That's what I expected, that it would break off. So the only thing we can do is really uh, to cut them off level and then drill them out. So since we can't get it out, we're gonna grind it off with the Dremel and then drill it out. So now we're going to try to get them flat and then um, center punch it and then drill it out. That's about right. That looks pretty much center to me. Doing this very slowly. I think we're almost through. All right. So I'm going to do the other two and then we'll see how we can get on with this, on how we can 
further remove this. I drilled the holes to size and I'm going to put some thread inside with a tap and a little bit of cutting lubricant is um, always very welcome in this kind of work. And let's see if we can get the stud in. Yeah, and that's just working fine. So I'm going to do the remaining two and this part is then ready. I have removed the old studs, we drilled them out and then we put new tread in. So now I can put the new studs up. And I'm going to use again a nut and counter nut to tighten that down. I think I stated it before, but this is the kind of stuff that takes always a lot of time uh, when you're rebuilding an engine. Broken off bolts or studs are always a bit of a pain in the butt to get them out. And I didn't want to damage the um, exhaust manifold. Uh, if you're too rough with it, you can crack it. So I'd rather be safe than sorry. So let's install the um, intake and exhaust manifold and first of all we're going to put up new gaskets of course and these are nice thick ones and they fit quite alright and I want, just want to make sure everything is fine, that looks good. Now on the edges we'll use big bolts, uh, there are two studs in the middle and then I have these special attachments that will press the intake or exhaust manifold against the cylinder head. It's going to be interesting to see how that will go on there. I'm just going to try to fit first these so I can hold it at least a little bit in place. All right, I'll do the same thing on this side. Remember that when I set the special bracket well that's the one let me just see how I need to fit it so that should go on like this so these are new pieces and as you can see they don't fit 100% so I have to cut off the edges a little bit so I grinded off the edges on this part and now it fits nicely and I have a copper nut that will hold it in place There we go. So I will do the remaining ones and then we are all set and done. Many of the parts that I get for this engine, although it's not a traction of our engine, but very similar, don't really fit. So like this bolt, for instance, I had to shorten it in because they were too long. Although they were sold exactly for this engine. It, it's happening all the time and that you lose a lot of time, of course. The same thing with these uh, metal holders uh, that are holding the intake manifold against the cylinder head you know those uh, are too wide so I had to grind them off so there's always a little bit of work to be done nothing is uh, always fitting from the first moment but maybe that's all the fun so I'm gonna tighten this down and then we torque it all up and then the intake and exhaust manifold is all finished All right, so they are all nicely to torque, except the middle one, which I can't put to torque because I can't get to it. So I will have to do it by hand. I think this is about right. The exhaust and intake manifold took a bit longer than I expected, to be very honest. Um, the drilling out, the tapping, and then all the little adjustments on the bolts and the little attachments, I took a bit of time. 
So the next thing we're going to do is to install the Solex carburetor. Now this carburetor is a 32 IAC, uh, a not very common carburetor from Solex, but I found out some information on the internet that the same carburetor was used on some Willis Jeeps. And it has what we call a by starter on the side here and it has an acceleration pump on the other side. So we're going to take this carburetor apart and clean it all up. I already have it blasted with some Gardner 360 very gently not to damage anything but still we want to make sure that everything at the inside is clean and we may have to replace the seals here and there or we may even have to make some seals for that or gaskets because I don't have a spare kit for it. I'm not going to rejet the whole carburetor I'm going to take it as is. I'm not sure if this is the original carburetor that was actually on Old Rusty. It looks a bit small to me if you ask me for a truck, but then again, maybe it is. Um, and besides the carburetor, uh, we have a heat shield that we need to install, but also we have a insulation part here. This is the insulation part to protect the heat from the exhaust manifold uh, going up into the carburetor so the fuel doesn't start to boil. And at the end, uh, we will fit, of course, a reconditioned um, air filter. And I li really like this kind of air filter. This is neat. So, um, a lot of work to do on the carburetor. So, let's get on with it and start taking the carburetor apart. So, the first thing I'm going to do is to take off the by start. Okay, that can go off. And you can see immediately how much debris there is inside this carburetor. And that's why we need to take it apart and clean it all up. So let's take the top panel off. Now I have to be honest, I already released the nuts a bit, or the bolts, so it doesn't take too long for me to take this apart. And let's see. And inside we should have a valve and this is the uh, valve that will shut down the fuel when it comes into the flow chamber. Right here we have the flow chamber. Uh, let me put this aside. Inside we got our float and the float is actually laying inside and this is the actual float. And as you can see, lots of debris again on the carburetor. Look at all this uh, dried up stuff. I don't even know what it is. No wonder this carburetor wouldn't work. So let's take the acceleration pump, and I think that's what it is here, um, apart and see what's inside. This might actually have a membrane inside. And that might be gone. Don't know, but we'll see. Uh, it looks like it's been opened before. And some long and short screws. And I do not have a manual, so I need to be very careful while I take things apart. So let's see if this is going to come off or not. Look on the jets, how clean they are. Okay. And this looks like all corroded and dirty. And as you can see, things are extremely dirty, so it's going to take a bit of cleaning up. So now we're going to take some of the jets off and the adjustment screws. So So I reckon this is the main jet, so let's take this out. And again, really, really dirty, doesn't it? Look at this. 
What else? Uh, we still have a small jet here we can remove. Let's see. <clears throat> It's going to be a good thing that I have everything taped uh, because I might need this when I put everything back together because I will not remember all these parts out of my head. And now we'll remove the screws of the butterfly so we can remove the axle. Let's do it. Now I'm going to turn the butterfly and try to pull it out if I can. There we go, and it's out. And now I should be able to remove this axle. With all these pieces now apart, it's time to put it in the ultrasonic cleaner again and clean out all the channels because there are a lot of channels in these parts that are really clogged up with debris. So. That's the first thing we're going to do now, is to get it all really well cleaned up as much as we can. And then we're going to put it back together, making sure that all the channels inside the carburetor uh, are cleaned and free of any clogging or material, because there's a lot of stuff in there. So the next step is to move all the parts into the ultrasonic cleaner. And the small parts are placed in the back, otherwise they fall through the grid. And we're going to let this soak for about an hour or so, and that should remove most of the debris and dirt. And the bag, I need to fill up, obviously, with liquid, else it's not going to work too well. While the carburetor has been cleaned up, uh, we're going to start to work on the flywheels. Now I have two flywheels. One I got back from France, uh, where I picked up some spare parts, and the other one is the original one. Now that's the original one. Now don't worry about the height, it's just because of the bolt sticking out more on that one. But as you can see, um, a lot of the teeth are really worn out, and I think they tried to start it a couple of times when the engine was seized. And in this area we have a lot of damage. And the other one is a lot better, so I'm going to rework a little bit this one and then I'm not going to use the old one or the original one of the uh, old rusty motor because of that damage. But let me show you that damage, what it is. And here you can actually see the damage on the actual crown wheel. Um, the other one is a lot better. And that's the other flywheel which has far less damage on it, so I'm going to clean this one up, uh, take a bit of the edges off, and then we'll use this uh, flywheel on Old Rusty. And the way I'm going to clean up these teeth is with a, just using a soft file, and go softly along the edge to take all the um, sharp edges off. It doesn't have to be a lot. starts to feel already a lot better. I'm finished correcting the flywheel or the crown on the flywheel at least and now we can start installing the flywheel together with the pressure plate and the clutch and the bearing. Um, now the flywheel mounts on the crankshaft and one of the bolts is a bit offset so you cannot just miss it. Um, so I marked it with a white spot, so if you see the white spot, that's what it is because I tried to fit it before because it takes a bit of looking around uh, before you find it. So let's put it up and see how we can fit all this together. All right, and then we have a plate to lock the bolts in place and that is not the one so you have to find it the right way that's it and that's because of this one offset bolt and the torque on this is 2.5 kilograms I'm just gonna uh, fit it first like this loosely and then of course I forgot something and you guys didn't tell me. I 
can't do this right now. And luckily I saw it because, because in the middle there is supposed to be a bearing. And that's the old bearing, but I'm going to replace it with a brand new bearing that we're going to place inside that socket now. And before I knock it in, I'm going to clean this up, put some grease on it, and then we should be good to go. The old bearing was an open bearing, so you would have to pack it with grease. But the new one is a sealed type, so you don't need to pack anything. But still, I will put some grease inside so it slides in better. And also that little hole there all the way in the back, that's where the tip of the axle coming from the uh, gearbox fits in, or the main shaft from the gearbox. All right. So let's try and see if we can get this guy in. It should go in quite easily. Now, I typically put it completely in place with a socket which is about the same size and gently tap it in. So you know it's fully fitted to the end. And now we can fit the plate, uh, the one that I missed before guys. And the bolts or the nuts. And this we're going to tighten down to about 2.5 kilogram of torque. And then we'll bend over these lips. Now, I would have wanted to have a new uh, locking plate. Unfortunately, I couldn't get that. It wasn't available, so I have to use the old one. So let's uh, torque him down to 2.5 kilograms. So now it's time to fit the clutch and that will go in here and the problem with the clutch is always to center it uh, and I don't have a tool to do that so I'll probably stick some plastic inside and then see if I can center it and I probably can hold it a bit like this. So let's see if we can get this a bit sorted out. There we go. Let me get a screwdriver to hold it a little bit in position. Now this pressure plate is a feather though, I can see that on the markings and it says made in France. Typically Faraday is uh, quite pretty good stuff so and the clutch uh, was still in a pretty good condition so I did not put the new clutch in. And now I need to jiggle a bit with this so we can get it nicely aligned. All right so that looks about right. So let's see uh, it's pretty much aligned I would say. Yeah because if you don't get it aligned properly, you're going to have lots of issues to get the gearbox in. You can hear the springs while I'm tightening it. I'm always amazed about um, clutches that they actually transfer all the power of the engine onto the axles. That they can pull a truck like this, you know, with a small surface like that. So we have the flywheel installed, I've got the clutch installed, the pressure plate installed. And I made some marks on the flywheel, you might have seen that. And there is somewhere a big groove in the flywheel. I'm just looking where it is in the back. 
and that cut there is actually to put a tool in through the bell housing of the vehicle. I will rotate it so you can actually see it because we still want to do one extra check to see if the Bendix is grabbing properly onto the flywheel. So let's have a look. I will need to rotate it so you can actually see it. Got to watch out for my fingers here. It's coming up. And here it is, that big timing mark, and that's where you fit the tool in through the bell housing. And that is actually eight degrees before top that center. And of course, that timing mark is of no use to me because I don't have the bell housing on. But now let's have a look on the Bendix. So the part here is the Bendix, which is, will fly forward as soon as I start the starter motor, and it will grab onto the flywheel. I'm just trying to see if it's going to grab. Yep, and it's going to grab just fine. And if it goes all the way out, it's going to come right there. And I should grab properly the um, flywheel or the crone wheel. See how it grabs? And that's what's going to happen. So that's good. So next is the water pump. And I have shot blasted the water pump with Garnet 360. And then I painted it with uh, green, the same color as the engine block. And this is actually engine paint. Um, it took a bit of time to clean it all up, but at the end it turned out quite nice. Now the water pump itself um, has a greasing point here. You can see that little lid here. We have to fill in oil. And there's another greasing nipple on the other side, right here. So that I will grease as soon as we have it mounted. If you look on the back side, you can actually see the brass or the bronze part. And you can see how we blasted it all out to make it absolutely clean. I suppose it's watertight because I did check all the seals and that should be good. But then again, you never know. Now, uh, to mount the water pump, there is a backing plate and this is this backing plate. And for that, I needed to have a gasket and I didn't have a gasket. I, I ordered one, but it was way too big. So I had to cut one myself. And this over here is a roll of gasket paper for which you can cut your own gaskets. And that's what I've done on this one. It's not very hard. I'll show you in a few seconds on how you can do this. And then of course I have another gasket that goes on the engine block. That's okay, that one. And then you have the bolts. And of course I'm gonna use some silicon based uh, fitting joining kit compound. This is not really silicon though, but it makes it more watertight and better for the actually gaskets. So let me show you on how I actually cut uh, these uh, joints out of this joint paper. Creating your own seals isn't very difficult. Um, you can buy this special paper and it's not expensive at all by the roll and it comes in different thicknesses and all what you need to do is take a part and use a pen and just trace around it like so and then mark all the holes where they should be and then it's just a matter of cutting it all out remove it <coughs> And then you can cut along the edges and you can cut the holes and you're, set, you're all set. Now for the holes, you can buy stencils to knock them out. I use, I don't have stencils. I use something else. Let me show you. It's going to be a little bit funny, guys. That's what I actually use to cut these little holes so where the bolts go through and have different sizes, as you can see. And this is nothing more than a tool that they use for belts uh, or, or leather work and, and then you put the part in between and you just squeeze hard and then you have the hole. All right, enough of this. So the first thing we're going to do on the water pump is to install the backing plate. And this is the backing plate. And that goes on like so. And of course, we need to fit the gasket in between. And this hole right here, that will fit right into the uh, cylinder head. And that's where the water will cycle through. So the little bronze turbine that you see here will rotate, uh, driven by the belt. It will actually suck in water and then push it back out through the hole. So 
uh, we got to make sure that all this is fitted properly. So, so before I fit actually the gasket itself, I made sure that the surface is absolutely clean. And I can see there's some debris there. And if there's something left on it, I typically use a razor blade or a Stanley knife blade or whatever you have uh, to scrape all that debris off. Of course, I want to make sure it doesn't get inside the pump. That would not be good, would it? All right. And now we can actually fit the gasket. But before I fit the gasket, I'm going to put some seal up. All right. So now let's put the seal up. Now to make sure that all the holes fit properly, I use a bit, but the back end of a bit, of course, to squeeze things in, see? Because this is a homemade gasket, so it has to fit right. And for the bigger ones, I, I use just a bigger bit. I think this is the one. Yep, there we go. And one more here. And now I'm going to fit this gasket exactly the same way as the other one. I'm going to hold it in place with some of this um, sealing kit. Because this is more to hold it in place than anything else. I made a bit of a mess out of it, didn't I? This being a universal seal, you can see that there is no opening here and that's because it's been built for different models so but that doesn't really matter that area so now we'll install the water pump and I'm going to put the bowls through there first of all and we fit the small bolts we are putting things to torque Now we'll put some oil into it, just a little bit, not too much because it spills over easily as you can see. And I'm just going to rotate it a few times. It doesn't need a lot of oil, just a little bit. And of course I'm going to give it some grease. Alright, so the next thing we're going to do is to reassemble the distributor. I took the distributor apart so I could actually check all the individual parts. There's the cap of the distributor, there's the rotor that are inside. This is the old one by the way and I have a brand new one for it. The old breaker points, the new breaker points, the old capacitor and the new capacitor, the base plate and some small screws and then of course the locking clips uh, to hold the cap in place onto the body. And this is the actual distributor that has been cleaned up. And let me give you a little view inside because that's an interesting area to look at. I like any other engine, uh, ignition needs advance at higher RPMs so or when you're trying to accelerate. And most of the time you would have a vacuum system sitting on the side and then it would uh, turn that base plate back and forth. But in this case it is not happening. All what we have inside are what we call bob weights and they can actually go open by the centrifugal force so when this whole thing is um, rotating fast this will fly open as you can see and it will then advance the ignition so this is purely working on centrifugal force uh, and these are the bob weights now you can play around with this by putting more or less tension on the springs I don't know what it's set for right now I know there's test benches for it but I don't have one but we'll see it when it's on the engine and when the engine is running for the first time, if it ever is going to run, of course. And then we can check out what we need to do, if we need more advance or not. Uh, the less tension you put on the springs, the faster you're going to get the advance.
I also got a new ignition coil and this is a 12 volts coil and you're probably going to say oh yeah but wait a minute your starter motor is only a 6 volt starter motor yeah I know but I'm going to fit a 12 volts ignition system so I'm going to work with two batteries one special battery uh, which I'm going to use for the starter purposes and then I'm going to have another uh, 6 volts battery in series with the other one uh, to generate 12 volts um, and, and that should just work out just fine and of course I've got some new cables that come with it uh, so now we're going to start putting things together and then explain a bit on how this is all supposed to work so the first thing I'm going to do after I have oiled a bit the bob weights I'm going to put in the base plate and this is the base plate and I just need to make sure that I put it in the right way because otherwise that won't fit. Now the way I know how to fit it, I made a scratch on it when I took it apart where this stud was. So, so this is a, a spring all right, to hold the cap in place. So let's see if we can get this in. Now comes a bit the more difficult part. Uh, this is the hole where the hot wire comes through. So the wire that will be connected to the ignition coil. So the plus 12 volts or the plus 6 volts depends on the voltage on the vehicle. And it does this by coming through with this bolt. And you can see that this bolt is insulated. It should not be touching at all the metal because otherwise you have a short. And that's why we have these little washers that need to go in there all the way inside and they will prevent this little bolt to touch the metal so this is how this is working so pay attention to this if you assemble things like this because otherwise it won't work all right and then I have another insulation washer a bigger one and now I have a metal one and now I can put the nut up. And then the real cable will fit in between that and this little nut here. So I want to make sure that I have no short. So I'm going to use an ohm meter on the lowest setting and check. Now I have continuity, but on this bolt here, I should have no continuity. If I do, then I have a short in the way I assemble things. So now I'm going to fit the breaker points and these are the old breaker points and you can see that they are pitted and that's most likely because the condensator or the capacitor was faulty or dried up or not working. So that's why we're going to put a new one up. But first of all, let us mount the breaker points. So these are the new breaker points that will go in. But before I put them in, I'm going to clean the contact areas with acetone so they are absolutely uh, free of any oil or debris. It's pretty simple and straightforward to place them. Now, of course, that will vary from car to car. Now, now it's in. Sometimes you need to push it a bit. Okay. So now let's uh, put the spring up, which is going in this way. And now I need to release this nut a bit and make sure that this part grabs on this hot wire nut, right? There we go. And that's in. And make sure that the spring is actually not touching the chassis, okay? Because otherwise we have a, the same shortage issue. All right. Are we going to measure this out again just to make sure? So we're going to do a little double check and to see if everything is mounted correctly. The breaker points have to be open. That's the first point. So they should not be in touch with each other. We will measure with an ohmmeter on the chassis or the metal part of the uh, distributor. And then we'll measure on the hot wire. And we should have no continuity, which is good. Then we'll measure between the part of the breaker point which is moving up and down or left to right and the hot wire and there we should have continuity and we do. All right, so this is good. So now we're going to install the capacitor. 
and we connect it up to the hot wire where our plus 12 volts or plus 6 volts will arrive. I don't need to tighten that up right now. Now here you see the cam and this is the cam with four corners basically or lobes that will open and close the breaker points while this is spinning around. See? See that? And I tend to grease this a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. So now we're going to adjust the breaker point gap. Now for this specific engine uh, it's 0.4 millimeters. And for that one we will need a feeler gauge. So I'm going to tighten this slightly, not too much. And on this screw here you can actually adjust things. See? Like so. So to adjust the gap. Now I'm going to degrease my filler gauge and this is a gauge and you can probably see the gauge is 0.4 with the rotor at its maximum point right so you should rotate the axle so they are they are as widest as they can be there we go let's see yeah that's about right and I tighten it up and now that is basically ready. So now we'll put the new rotor up and that fits right here and that's keyed. There's a key on it so you can't go wrong with that. So I'm going to rig this up. I'm going to put the distributor cap up and that is keyed. Put the clips up. There we go. And now I should connect my power supply my coil and a couple of cables and a spark plug and we should be able to try it out. So we have assembled the complete distributor and here I'm having a little setup to test it all out to see if it's going to work or not. So what I have right here is the distributor with the distributor cap, the new rotor inside, the new breaker points inside, a new capacitor, I have an ignition coil 12 volts and I have four spark plugs rigged up in the front and I have a 12 volts power supply. And this is going to be like my engine. So I will be able to rotate in the back here the rotor because typically that rotor is going to be rotated by your camshaft which is driving the notch here. And then that rotor inside will distribute the sparks amongst the uh, four uh, spark plugs. However, it can't do this if there is no high voltage available. So we need a higher voltage coil for that. And the way this works is that plus 12 volts comes from your battery. It flows to your ignition coil, the positive side, which is the primary winding. It comes back out on the other side on the primary winding. And then it goes to the hot point on your distributor, the wire that goes inside your distributor. That wire ends up actually on the breaker points. Now, if the breaker points are open, no current is flowing. If the breaker points are closed, then current will flow from your power supply through the coil, primary winding, into your distributor, through the breaker points, and back to the ground, this black cable, and back to the ground of your power supply. So now we have current flowing through the coil. So each time the breaker points are closing, we have current flowing, and then when they open up, the current stops. Now this is causing an induction and the induction happens towards the secondary coil, the secondary winding of the high tension coil and that is the outlet of the high tension coil right here. Now that is fed to the top of the distributor and inside we got this little rotor which is going to distribute in the right position the spark to the right uh, spark plug or to the right cylinder and that's why it's important when we go in to fit the distributor that we got this right. Uh, and that we also have the timing right at the right moment in time. But that's not for now. Now we're going to just to see if the whole system is working. So let me give you a little bit of a close-up first so you can see what I'm talking about. Here I have rigged up four spark plugs and cabled them up to the distributor. The plus 12 volts going into the distributor coming from the ignition coil primary winding. Ignition coil positive wire coming from the power supply or your battery and the output of that primary winding is going back to your distributor. 
and over here I have a power supply, 12 volts, not a lot of amperage, only 2.5 amps, so that's a pretty low, but it will work uh, for the purpose of the test. So let me turn that on. And now you can see, um, I'm just going to make sure that we have no current flowing, so I'm going to set the voltage to about uh, 12 volts. Yeah, that will be it. I'm going to give it some current. So my hand is going to be the camshaft spinning the distributor, okay? And these are the spark plugs, one, two, three, and four. This one is a bit hidden behind this spanner here because I need to keep it in place. So let me turn that on and I'm gonna spin it and hopefully you will see the ignition sparks on the spark plugs while I'm rotating. So now that we have tested out the ignition system, we will go and install it on the engine of Old Rusty. We've seen it spark on all four spark plugs, of course not in the right sequence because I might not have cabled it up in the right way. I just did a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But now it's time to adjust all that and therefore we'll have to look on the crankshaft. So making sure that the first piston is in top dead center at the end of its compression stroke. And then I want to make sure that the rotor is pointing to the first um, cylinder or the first lead which is going to the first spark plug in the first cylinder. So this is how we're going to do that. Now to find out how we are on top of that center we'll just keep a close eye on the inlet and outlet valve of cylinder number one and the position of the piston and then we should be all set to go. So let's have a look on how we can do that. So I removed the valve cover to find out exactly when I'm at top of that center for the first cylinder. And we're going to keep an eye on those two valves. The first valve is an outlet, the second one is an inlet valve. Both should be closed, right? So I'm going to rotate the engine in its normal rotating direction and then keep an eye on what's happening. And then we'll stop at the right time. Nothing happens. Outlet valve goes open, means piston is coming up. That's not the stroke we want. Now the gases are almost out. Now the inlet valve is opening up, meaning that we are sucking in fresh air and gas. Piston is going down. And now that valve is closing up. And in principle, we should be getting close to top that center now, because now we have compression stroke. So let me turn that a bit more, a bit more. Uh, let's see, I think we are about there. So let's check if the piston is at its top that center and the piston is right there. So this is very near to top that center. I can rotate it a bit more and find out. Now we know that we are at top that center of cylinder number one. So now I'm going to install the distributor and point the rotor in such a direction that it's pointing to the lead going to cylinder number one. And I don't really care which lead that is on the distributor cap as long as I can find number one. So this is the distributor and you can see there's a key system. This is the key and it fits actually in the shaft, which is the extension of the oil pump by the way and driven by the camshaft. And I'm gonna make sure that I have the capacitor on the outside and I'm just gonna move it in and I'll line that up to make sure that fits properly. And I think that guy is actually in now. So now I'm going to lock this in place. This is just a locking plate, so that doesn't do anything on the adjustment. I think this is tight enough. And now I can still rotate the whole distributor, you see. I can rotate it the way I want to rotate it. Now, before I proceed, I will put the rotor up and see which way that rotates when the engine is actually running. So it's going clockwise. So that means that I should position this just at the time that the breaker points open up. When the beep is gone, they're open. Yep. That's where I should have it. 
now the breaker points are opening up and I should get the spark and this is the moment of spark which is very near to top that center now obviously it's not at the right spot 100% but enough to get the engine going now the only question is does the rotor point to the right spark plug if I now place the rotor into the distributor and I can mark a white line on the housing of the distributor then I know exactly where that points to once I put the cap up. So now let me put the cap up and I gotta make sure it's keyed right. Here we go. Now I can see that the white marker is lining up with this outlet. So this is my cylinder number one. And we also know that it rotates clockwise so the next one that's gonna hit is cylinder number three because of the firing order. And then we're going to hit either four or two. I still have to check that. But that's how you can verify it. And it doesn't really matter where you start with this. Right? As long as you know where the rotor is pointing. So let me um, lock this a little bit into place. And then we do a few more tests. So I have cabled everything up. And now we're going to rotate the engine and see what happens. And there is a spark plug. I can see it sparking. So folks, we're nearing the end of this video and we did quite a bit of work. We installed the flywheel, the clutch, the pressure plate, the intake manifold, the exhaust manifold. We replaced the studs on the exhaust manifold. That was a bit of work. We also took the carburetor apart and we started cleaning it up. That's still in the cleaning process. I can't finish it up today. And uh, we took the distributor apart and we, we reassembled it. We put new points in, we put a new rotor in. We checked it out, a new capacitor, and making sure that everything worked fine. We tested it on the bench and then finally we installed it on the motor where we actually uh, tested it out to make sure that it fires at the right moment in time. So we got all that kind of aligned. So that's good to go for the next video where we're going to most likely crank up the engine. There's still a little bit of small work to be done. I have still to hook up the hoses for the water pump. Oh yes, before I forgot, we also installed the water pump. Uh, so uh, once we installed the hoses for the water pump and I installed some electrical cables and we installed some fuel lines and an exhaust and we got the carburetor back together, then we can start it up. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and I'll see you in my next video on Old Rusty. Bye bye.